Uh, so I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Reich about six years ago when I was taking a class on preventing bullying in schools. Um, those of you that have me know that I end every class with the saying, have a wonderful day, be kind to one another. And we can learn a lot about that from this man. So without any further ado, Mr. Werner Reich. Thank you very much. Good morning. Today, I will be talking to you about what happens when we don't take care of each other. On August 24th, 1941, in the middle of World War II, while Germany was bombing Great Britain, Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill addressed the people of Great Britain. He spoke to them on the radio about the German invasion of Russia. And this is what he had to say. The aggressor, and by this he meant the German military, retaliates by the most frightful cruelties. As his armies advance, whole districts are being exterminated. Scores of thousands, literally scores of thousands of executions in cold blood are being perpetrated by the German police troops upon the Russian patriots who defend their native soil. Since the Mongol invasion of Europe in the 16th century, there has never been methodical, merciless butchery on such a scale or approaching such a scale. And this is but the beginning. Famine and pestilence have yet to follow in the bloody ruts of Hitler's tanks. We are in the presence of a crime without a name. It took many, many years until a proper name could be found. And the name is the Holocaust. And I'm here to speak about it today. But before we speak about the Holocaust, there are a few questions which we have to answer. Of course, the first one is, what do the words Holocaust and Shoah mean? And both words can be used completely interchangeably. Holocaust comes from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible and consists of two words, holos, which means whole, and kostos means to burn, a whole burnt offering. That means the offering is completely burnt and it comes a totally useless killing. And shor is Hebrew. It simply means disaster or tragedy. There is a third word which you may have probably never even encountered. It's porimos. It's a word that the gypsies are using. It means to be swallowed by the devil or by hell. The next question, of course, is what was the Holocaust? The Holocaust was the Nazis' destruction of selected group and their culture. The Nazis didn't just randomly kill people, but they broke into their museums, into their houses of worship, they stole the works of art, and then burned down the buildings. What proof do we have that the Holocaust even happened? Well, we have mass graves, we have witnesses, we have what's left of concentration camps, we have uh, testimony, we have photographs taken by murderers, trials by murderers. In addition to this, in the town of Bad Arosen in Germany, we have a huge warehouse that has 16 miles of shelving. And on these 16 miles of shelving, you have roughly 50 million documents that prove the persecution of roughly 17 million people. These documents have not been put together by some American or Jewish organization. No, these documents have all been put together by the German government. Because if you were a commander of a town in Eastern Europe and you were told to kill everybody, you couldn't just write back to Berlin and say, hey boss, I've done it. They wanted to see proof. So, what you have here is you have birth certificates, 
baptismal documents, school certificates, passports, letters, all different types of documents. Yet despite all that, we still have people who say the Holocaust didn't exist. Who are these Holocaust deniers? Holocaust deniers are people who are prejudiced, they're filled with hate, and simply ignore the truth. They say that despite the proof, the SS did not kill. Holocaust deniers believe that this is the proper way to treat Jewish men, this is the proper way to treat Jewish women and children, and this is the proper way to treat gay people, and this is the proper way to treat people of color. Holocaust deniers believe that they imagine supremacy as some master race justifies the murder of everybody else. Never ever debate a Holocaust denier. Because truth does not need a defense. The next question is of course, what caused the Holocaust? During the late 1920s, there were many financial disasters. There was the crash of the stock market, there was widespread unemployment, there was the valuation of money in Europe. And in the United States, we had a president who had a very simple solution, hard work. And so we built roads and airports, we built schools and fire stations. In Germany, you had a different solution to the same problem. Eliminate all people who could be a threat to Germany, and then all the financial problems will be solved. That means communists, political opponents, comedians, critics, writers, artists, and the inferior and the useless. Jews, Catholics, Jehovah's Witnesses, Gypsies, black people, communists, and gays, they were considered inferior. And handicapped people were considered useless. And they were simply murdered. Now, obviously, this was a matter of intolerance. And what many people are looking for is exactly the opposite, tolerance. But tolerance really isn't exactly what we want because tolerance means to put up with something. We don't want tolerance. What we want is acceptance. Accept people regardless of color, race, sexual orientation, age, origin, religion, or sex. And bullying for any of these reasons is in New York State a hate crime, a bias crime. And the shortest penalty is 18 months in jail, even if you're under 16. Nobody in this room by looking at these boxes would say for sure which of them contains gold and which contain garbage. Yet uh, many of you just by looking at people seem to know exactly who is good and who is bad. Let me ask you this. Would you like to be judged for college admission based on your looks? Of course not. So. Why judge other people? It took us 200 years to make our schools look like this and our Supreme Court look like this. We have blacks, whites, Hispanic, Catholics, Protestant, Jews, men and women. This is how Germany started in 1933 and exactly 12 years later, this is how it ended. In addition to this, there were 68 million people dead. 
Whenever we speak about the Holocaust, we say the Germans did this, the Germans did that, the Germans did the others. But were all the killings done by the Germans? Look at this list. Every single nation that Germany occupied provided collaborator killing units, except one nation, Bulgaria. The next question is, of course, was the Holocaust the battle of Christians against Jews? That's how it's very often presented. We say the Jews suffered and nobody else did. We know that six million Jews died. But what we seem to forget is that roughly six million Christians and Muslims died too. Altogether, roughly 12 million people were murdered during the Holocaust. If I were to ask you to imagine 12 million people, uh, you couldn't. Numbers much, much too large. So let's do this. Let's line up 12 million people, one person behind the other, and allow one foot three inches for each person. And if we started that line in New York City, that line would stretch from New York across the Midwest, the Rocky Mountains, all the way to California. That's 12 million people. Roughly six million died in various concentration camps, and the other six million in the killing fields of Ukraine and other countries. How was it possible for so much evil to succeed? It has been said that all that is necessary for evil to succeed is that good people do nothing. In 1933, when Hitler and his party came to power, and they were burning books by American, European authors. The good people did nothing. When they arrested people and put them into camps, the good people did nothing. When they banned paintings by Van Gogh and Picasso, the good people did nothing when they murdered 3,000 Catholic priests, the good people did nothing. When they arrested people of color and put them into concentration camps, the good people did nothing. When they lined up gypsies and shot them, the good people did nothing. When they wiped out entire towns such as Lidice in Czechoslovakia and murdered 81 children by putting them into trucks and pumping the gas of the exhaust pipes right back into the truck, and then dug up the cemetery, pulled out the coffins, and shot all the men in the town, the good people did nothing. These doctors and nurses, and they are doctors and nurses, participated in the murder of roughly 250,000 victims because their life was unworthy of life. They were handicapped people, mentally retarded people, even babies with birth defects. And the good people did nothing. Here are just some of the people who were persecuted. Specific authors, Polish noblemen, Catholic priests, opposing Protestant ministers, gypsies, gay people, even farmers who hid food. And the good people did nothing. What kind of the people were the Nazis, really? Nazis were bullies cowards who wrote anonymous letters. They sent letters to 
newspapers, they sent the letters to government offices and places of employment, and people lost their jobs and they were arrested, and uh, many people committed suicide. Today we call it cyberbullying. It's exactly the same thing. And many young people commit suicide because of that. Nazis were bullies who belonged to government organized gangs. They broke windows and stores, committed senseless destructions, painted on walls, just like people still do right here on Long Island. Nazis were bullies who enjoyed power. So as you can see, they are kicking a man on the ground, just like these young kids in Germany tormented an old man. And uh, just like these Long Island bullies were involved in the 2008 murder of Marcelo Lucero. Nazis knew one thing, that the bystanders protect the bullies. And so, as you can see, somebody wrote on the blackboard, the Jews are our biggest enemy, and two Jewish students had to stand next to the blackboard and being embarrassed, and the other students didn't say anything. And just like these Jews who had to scrub sidewalks and everybody else was standing around and having a wonderful time laughing, just like some of you are standing around and laugh when somebody has to pick up books off the floor in your school. Nazis looked for ways to oppress others. So they had some 2,000 anti-Jewish rules, 2,000 of them. For instance, public was forbidden to buy from Jews. So they had outside Jewish stores, signs which says, Germans, defend yourself. Don't shop from Jews. Jews were fired by all hospitals, schools, colleges, and corporations. We can't imagine in this country somebody saying, I don't hire you because of your background. Yet, it wasn't too long ago when we had signs like these all over the United States. And we had signs like these. And we had signs like these. And signs like these. Jews got a big J stamped on their identification card. And they got a new middle name. Uh, if you were a man, it was Israel. And if you were a woman, it was Sarah. And so here you have a typical Jewish passport with a sign with the middle name of Sarah and a big J stamped on it. In Germany, you had to wear a big star with the word Jude on it. But if your name was Anne Frank, and you lived in Holland, then the name would be Hod, which is Dutch. And these were the biggest enemies of Germany. Because as long as you have little children, they will grow up and they too will have children. But if you manage to arrest all these little children and then murder them, there will be no more little children. And one and a half million little children were murdered. They had signs like these outside towns. Caution, Jews in village. They had special benches for Jews. It wasn't too long ago where we had special benches for black people in this country and special water fountains, and uh, special seats in the movie houses. Jews were 
placed in camps and in ghettos. And the good people did nothing. Why didn't the Jews fight back? Wouldn't it have been so easy? Well, it really wouldn't be because for every Jew there were 133 Germans. Not much of a fighting chance. So, if there were so few Jews in Germany, if hardly any German has ever seen a Jew, how did the Germans develop this hate against the Jews? Well, they had two ways of doing it. One of them is their slogan was, the Jews are our misfortune. And so whatever was wrong in your life, you could blame it on the Jews. If your car broke down, if your wife ran away, if your cake burnt in the oven, blame it on the Jews. And Nazis dehumanized the Jew. They showed the Jew as a worm, they showed the Jew as a snake, and they showed the Jew as a caterpillar. And uh, if you repeat a lie often enough, people will start believing it. And once they believed it, they had a very simple three-step logic. Jews were vermin, vermin must be exterminated, and therefore Jews must be exterminated. How about cartoons like this? Here, a Jew is a spider. But this cartoon is not from Germany. This cartoon is right here from the United States, from a newspaper published out on the West Coast that you can subscribe to it. White American resistance. And in it there are cartoons like this and cartoons like this. Obviously, the Jews of Europe tried to escape. So, 32 nations got together to discuss Who's going to take the Jews? Who's going to accept them? And uh, every single nation had some sort of an excuse why they didn't want the Jews. And the country, the representative who really set the tone to the conference was the Canadian representative who said, let the Germans solve their Jewish problem. In other words, why should we be involved in it? In other words, let the murderer solve his victim's problem. And of the 32 nations, exactly one, the Dominican Republic, was the only nation that accepted a few thousand Jews. In other words, the good people did nothing. And when the Germans found out that the world didn't give a damn about the Jews, you had the night of the broken glass. And in one night, 7,000 businesses were destroyed, 1,700 houses of worship were vandalized or burned down, 30,000 people were arrested, and within a month, 1,000 were murdered. And then the Jews were fined for these Nazi riots. And the good people did nothing. There was only one country that opened its arms, and that was Great Britain. They saved about 10,000 children under the age of 17. That's it. They could enter the country without parents, without guardians, without anything. And the vast majority of these children, I would say probably 80 or 90 percent of them, never saw their parents again. There was resistance in Germany. 
There was Hans Scholl and his sister Sophie Scholl and their friend Christoph Probst. They wrote six flyers over a six months period. They were arrested in the morning, sentenced to death by lunchtime and beheaded by the afternoon. In January 1942, the Nazis announced the final solution to the Jewish question. 10 million Jews were sentenced to death and 6 million were executed. And then World War II broke out. Nothing could be done anymore. In 1933, my father was a mechanical and an electrical engineer in Berlin, Germany. And uh, he lost his job. And no company in Germany was permitted to hire him. So we went three countries away. We went from Germany to Yugoslavia. And that's a picture of my sister and myself in 1933. I used to be adorable. <laughs> and uh, we lived in a very pretty town called Zagreb. But we immediately ran into a couple of problems. We had to learn two new languages, Croat and Serbian. And my parents never managed it. My father had great, great difficulty earning a living because the country didn't need the engineers. And here is a little bit of homework for you. If you thought you were going to sit here and do nothing, you were wrong. I want you to ask one of your foreign-born school friends, how many languages do they speak? What did their parents do for a living in their home country and how did they start in this country? And what problems did your friends have? Sit down and talk to them. Don't write big reports. No, don't do that. What's going on? No, 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 not now, not now. That's homework. Stop it. Stop it. Psst. Quiet, quiet, quiet. That's homework, not now. Sit down and listen to it. And that will give you some idea that will give you a big idea of the problems that millions of people went through. It's important that you understand that. As I said, we lived in a beautiful town and uh, sometimes we went on vacations in the mountains and sometimes down to the sea. That's a picture of me when I was about 11 years old. In the meantime, Germany occupied more and more countries all over Europe, and there was no way we could escape anymore. My father died, and shortly afterwards, Germany invaded Yugoslavia. And the man who came to rule the part where I lived was a man called Dr. Ante Pavelic. And he immediately opened a concentration camp called Yasenovac, where about 200,000 people were killed. And basically, all of them were killed either by starvation or by having their throats cut with knives like the in one town in Kragujevac, a couple of German soldiers were shot by the resistance movement. So they went to a local high school, a local school just like this, 
They picked up 200 students, they walked with them out of town, and they shot them. In another town, they, in Glina, they took all the men, brought them to the local church, took a picture of them, and then shot them and set the church on fire. Jews had to start wearing a yellow star, just like the one in Germany, only this one had the letter J on it, which says Zhidov, Jew. And as you can see, we had to wear the yellow star in the front and also in the back. And if you walk down the street and there was a soldier on the sidewalk, you had to step into the gutter. You couldn't be on the same sidewalk with a German soldier. And my mother was afraid that something would be happening to me. I was at that time 13 years old, so she placed me with a couple who worked for the resistance movement. And uh, so for the next two years, from the age of 13 to 15, I was hidden in an apartment and I developed films for the resistance movement. I couldn't go out on the street and I couldn't go near the windows because people from the street would see me. I couldn't wear shoes because the people in the apartment below would hear me. And one day when I was 15 years old, there was a knock at the door and six Gestapo agents German secret police came in and they arrested the couple and they arrested me too. And they took me down to their headquarters and they beat the living daylights out of me and I still have some scars. They locked me up in a basement cell. There was no bed or anything, just concrete floor. And there was just a bucket to be used as a toilet. And I was there for three days. And after three days, they shipped me to a border town where I was locked up in a little cell, tiny little cell uh, that was filled with millions of fleas. And they just attacked me. I was wearing short sleep shirt and short pants and I was totally helpless there. After three days from there, I was shipped to Graz, Austria. And I found myself in this building, which still today is the police headquarters of the Graz police. I was up on the third floor in the back of the building, locked up with three other kids. Two of them had been arrested for burglary and the third kid had murdered his mother. And I was the fourth criminal there. And I spent six weeks in that jail, six weeks. And one day I looked out, out of the window into the yard of the police station and I saw my mother walking around in a circle with some other women. And that was the last thing, last time I ever saw my mother. I don't know what happened to her afterwards. From there, I was shipped to Vienna. And I spent the night in Vienna in this magnificent temple, a synagogue. By the time I came, they didn't look like this anymore, it looked like this. It was destroyed during the night of the broken glass. There was glass on the floor and water and soot and torn prayer books. It was a mess. And the next day, I and about 120 other people were put on a train and we were shipped on a two-day trip to Czechoslovakia. And I found myself in this building, in this place called Terezin. 
Uh, look at the thickness of the walls. Uh, look at the height of the wall. Uh, look at the funny shape of the wall. What it was, it was a fortress. It was an actual fortress that built was built about 150 years before. Uh, and uh, when planes were invented, the military couldn't stay there anymore because anybody would fly over it and just drop a bomb. So civilians moved in and about 3,000 people lived there in Terrazin. And when the Nazis took over, they said, hey, this is a perfect place for a concentration camp. You see, we have the walls, we have the buildings, people can't get out, so let's do that. And so they converted it into a concentration camp. What is a concentration camp? Well, if you have lots of different people living very happily together, and then suddenly one group says, hey, we are much, much better than the rest of them, the other people. They can take all the other people and they can concentrate them into one little area. And once they're concentrated in that area, there are lots of things you can do with them. You can uh, do nothing with them, you can put them to work, you can work them to death, you can cut their throats, or you can gas them. And the Nazis did all of these things. There were hundreds of these camps throughout Europe. The only high official who ever visited some of these camps was Himmler, and he only visited a couple of them. This is the way the camp looked. It was old and dilapidated. This is where we slept, and this is where we washed ourselves. And this is how people arrived. Actually, they didn't arrive like this until I came. I helped play these railroad tracks. I had lots of jobs. I also made baskets like these for carrying potatoes. And I also exterminated vermin from the buildings. We taped up the inside of the windows and then we put on gas masks and we put, took cyanide gas and we spilled these pellets around the building and then we slammed the door shut and uh, came back the next day, put on gas masks again and aired the place and swept out any dead rats or mice. I was there for 10 months. I didn't know anybody there. I couldn't write to the outside. I didn't even know where I was, to be quite honest with you. And most people there spoke Czech. After 10 months, they brought in a bunch of railroad cars, just like this. They brought 25 railroad cars, they loaded a hundred people per car, they put in a bucket, and they closed the doors and the windows, and off we went on a three-day train ride going east. Some people died, the bucket overflowed within a an hour or so, and for the next three days, we were lying in our own feces and urine. And then on the third day, they opened the doors and uh, we were immediately faced by bright sunlight that blinded us and a group of SS men and prisoners in striped uniform. And if you look at the picture very carefully, 
you will see that every single one of them had a walking stick and they were hitting us with these sticks over their heads, over their legs, shoulders, face, wherever they could, wherever they could reach, well, it made no difference whether you were a small two-year-old child or whether you were an old man or anything. The SS, they all had SS uniforms with a skull and crossbone on their caps, and they also had skull and crossbone on their lapel. And uh, these were special SS men who had volunteered to work in the concentration camp. They were brought in and they were tested. They were shown a prisoner and said, go over there and kill him. And if they could kill him without any qualms, they were accepted. Behind us there was a gate and next to us was electrically charged barbed wire. And we asked, where are we? And they told us, you are in Auschwitz too, also known as Birkenau, which was an extermination camp. We've never heard of Auschwitz, we never heard of Birkenau, and certainly never heard of extermination camps. There were actually three Auschwitz camps there. There was Auschwitz I, which was strictly an extension of the German penitentiary system. There were all criminals there, murderers, thieves, perverts, crooks, you name it. They've been brought there from the German prison system to work in the concentration camp as guards and as supervisors. Then there was Auschwitz III, which was a small factory, and then there was Auschwitz II, where the gas chambers were, and where people were killed. And this is the way Auschwitz II looked. Everybody arrived at the green spot at the bottom that's where the railroad tracks were. And then people went over to the left side, to the red spots. Probably 80% of the people who arrived, sometimes 100%, and they were gassed and their bodies were burned. And all the clothes that they wore and any property that they brought with them was taken to the black spot over on the left-hand side. That area was called Canada, and uh, I don't know why it was called that way. The area above the green spot was the men's camp. It uh, was also gypsy. One of the camps was a gypsy camp. One of them was strictly for Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, the area below the green spot was the women's camp. And over on the right-hand side, where the blue spot is, that's where the SS had their own barracks. And although the Allied troops knew what was going on in the camp, not one bomb ever fell on the railroad tracks, on the gas chambers, or on the military German barracks. In other words, the good people did nothing. This is the way the men looked in the camp, and this is the way the women looked. And all of us got a tattoo on our arms, and we also got a triangle and a number. And depending upon why you were in the camp, that's how the triangle was colored. So you had political prisoners were red, gay people pink, Jehovah's Witnesses purple, gypsies black, and Jews yellow, and thieves and murderers were light and dark green. And the thieves and murderers were the carpos, the camp police. And they wore an armband like this. And here you see a woman capo in action. 
These were typical SS men who were, and as women who worked there in the camp. They were having a wonderful time because they really didn't do too much work except they sorted prisoners when they arrived and they decided who shall go into the gas chamber and who shall stay alive. And this is one of the crematoria, one of the buildings that contained the gas chamber and the ovens. This is a typical barrack in which we lived. On each level, in each bunk, there were six people. Three were lying in one direction and the other three lying in the other direction. And so there was a constant drizzle of urine or feces from one level to the other. And sometimes the top level would collapse and fall on the middle level and the middle level on the lower level and kill the people on the lower level. This is a woman's barrack after liberation. And uh, as you can see, there were only three people on each level because the other people had left already before on a death march. This is also taken up for liberation. And as you can see, uh, the man in the middle has the only two properties that we had. We had no glasses, we had no spoon, we had no knives, we had no uh, pencils, paper, nothing. We had absolutely nothing. The man in the middle as I said, had the only two properties, a bowl and a spoon. And the bowl was filled in the morning with some brown water, and we got made out of acorns, and we got two ounces of bread made out of flour and sawdust. For lunch, we got a soup, which was <coughs> salt water into which Little pieces of dirty, unwashed potatoes were cut in, and then in the evening we got a similar soup and another piece of bread. We got a daily ration of about 400 calories, which would be equivalent to two slices of bread and butter. Eating that food uh, caused us to lose our teeth, we also got diarrhea, and this is the toilet that we had to use. And <coughs> there was no toilet paper there, and you could spend only a couple of minutes there. This is a bench they used to punish us in case if we didn't stand in line properly, if we had any work and didn't work hard enough. If we had a fight with one of the German criminals, you put your feet in the two holes in the bottom and then as this demonstration to General Eisenhower shows, uh, one criminal held your arms and the other criminal beat you with a stick. I've seen people dying on this bench. I once got 15 strokes on my back and I thought I'm gonna die. This is the way the barrack looked. And three times a day, we had to stand between the barracks and be, and be counted. And if one man out of five or 6,000 was missing, we had to stand there and <clears throat> do what they called sport. We had to jump, we had to roll, we had to do push-ups, we had to do knee bends, all different things. And usually people, some people died during that. There was no way you could escape from the camp. There was electrically charged barbed wire, wire if you touched it, you were dead. There were guard towers there, there were German shepherds that chased after you and tore you to shreds. 
And if you managed to escape, and a few did, you were invariably caught and brought back to the camp with a big sign round your neck which said, hooray, hooray, I'm back again. And then the person, if they were lucky, they were hanged. If they were not lucky, they found some other punishment. Uh, I once had to watch how two men were beaten to pulp with large wooden poles. Uh, one man tried to escape, so they took a barrel, they caught him and they took a barrel and they hammered nails from the outside of the barrel into the barrel, put the man in the barrel, closed the barrel and rolled it down a hill. Many people committed suicide, they just threw themselves against the wire and uh, died there. And every day the power was turned off for about half an hour and the bodies were removed and then again the whole thing started. This is a typical crematorium. There were four of them in our camp and uh, inside there was a gas chamber. This is where the people were jammed in with their arms raised high and then little children were thrown on top of them. The doors were locked and through this hole in the ceiling the cyclone B gas that was <clears throat> with prussic acid gas, the pellets were poured in and the people died. And when the people were dead, a group of prisoners removed any jewelry from their fingers and uh, push and gold teeth and put the bodies into these ovens or they burnt them outside. And all that remained of the people were boxes full of wedding rings, piles of glasses, shoes, clothing, or empty suitcases. And this is what we saw on a daily basis. Heavy smoke pouring over the camp, smelling of burnt flesh and burnt hair. I'm frequently being asked, what's the worst thing that happened to you while you were in the camp? The worst thing that happened, I was about 16 years old. And I didn't know from one day to the next whether I'm going to be alive. One day Dr. Mengele came into the camp. Dr. Mengele was a German doctor who experimented on people. And he also liked to select people for the gas chambers. He liked to decide who shall live and uh, who shall die and he was always immaculately get dressed and he had a belt buckle which said, God with us. He was also affectionately known as the angel of death. And he stood there with a group of SS men and they were telling jokes. They were laughing and having the time of their lives. And all the young people in the camp, those of us over the age of 12, there was nobody younger. All the young men, we had to strip naked uh, up to the age of 18, and we ran past Dr. Mengele. And there he stood and occasionally uh, moved his finger, and the person moved in the other direction. And when he was finished with it, there were 300 of us standing there and shivering in the cold. And then we had to run again and then there were 200 and eventually there were 89 of us. And the 89 of us, we were told to get dressed and we were moved into the camp which had the camp gallows. 
And the other 4,900 people in the camp over the next five days were sent to the gas chambers. Of the 89, when the war was over, roughly 10 months later, there were only 46 of us still alive. Today, there are roughly 12 of us still alive. I was sent after a while to Auschwitz I, where the criminals were, and I worked in the stables. I fed the horses, I brushed them, I watered them, whatever. In January 1945 was the coldest winter on record. The temperatures never they went above minus two degrees, they went down to minus 20 degrees, below freezing. <coughs> the, the snow covered the ground and we started on a, uh, 60,000 of us started on a death march. We walked for a couple of hours and then we stopped and those who couldn't get up were shot or they just froze to death. And we continued like that all day. And the first night we slept in some stables and the next day things got worse because people were getting weak, we had no food, the only water which we had was snow and ice, and there were bodies all over the road. And by the third day, we arrived at the railroad siding. By this time, we had walked 35 miles, and of the 60,000, 15,000 were dead. And the rest of us, we were loaded into open railroad cars. And we traveled from Poland under the guardianship of these young boys, 14, 16 year old boys with guns. We traveled all the way down to Austria for four days. I remember the first day and a little bit of the second day, but I can't remember the rest. If I would have frozen to death after that, uh, I wouldn't have known about it. It was so unbelievably cold. First of all, we were undernourished. We were all below weight. We had no fat on ourselves. We had very little clothing and we had no food and we had no heat. And after four days, we arrived in a place called Mauthausen. Mauthausen has been considered a concentration camp from hell. They forced, it was strictly for prisoners of war who had misbehaved in other prisoner of war camps. They had to carry 100 pound rocks up 186 steps and when they got to the top, they had to play a game called parachute jumping without a parachute. They had to push each other off the cliff into the valley. They were stripped naked in the winter and sprayed with water. They had some chambers there where they extracted the air. And so we limped, those of us who were still alive, limped through this gate and eventually came into this yard and we were taken into one of the barracks and we were showered. And that was the last shower we had for next four months. The, as we were showered, we all collapsed screaming with pain because all of us were frostbitten. And after three days, 
my feet started to rot. And there was a Serbian doctor there who somehow had some knives or so, and he cut off my toes on one foot without any anesthetic, and that's how he saved my life. And then things got really bad, because we were squeezed between Russian forces and American forces, and there was no food there. We ended up getting a tablespoon of moldy bread a day. I slept next to a dead man for three days just to get his ration of a spoonful of moldy bread. And on May 5th, one day before the end of the war, we were liberated by American forces. The few of us who were still alive looked like this. I was at that time 17 years old and I weighed 64 pounds. And the vast majority looked like this. And then the American forces gave us the only food they had, military rations. And we ate these rations and about 20,000 people died. They brought in the local population and they picked up the bodies and they buried them in these mass graves. After about three weeks, I was given a slip of paper and I hitchhiked by train back to Yugoslavia. And when I came back, there was no family left. There were no friends. There was just communism. And I lived under extreme communism for about two years. And after two years, I left and went to Great Britain. And when I came to Great Britain, I had a little problem. I had no schooling. My schooling stopped when I was 13 years old. I had no skills. And uh, I couldn't speak English. So I started working as a laborer then as a machine tool fitter, then as a tool and die maker. I got married, I came to the United States. I went to college for 10 years at night and I got my degree. The sign of a swastika always brings up all different types of feelings in us. In some of us, it brings the feeling of sorrow for having lost all our friends and our family. In some of us, it brings a feeling of anger. Anger that the general population didn't do anything, that the world didn't open their arms. And some of you, should consider it, looking at it, as a crime. It is a serious crime to paint a swastika. And the conviction could mean incarceration, difficulty getting into a college, extreme difficulty getting a college loan, and the impossibility of getting thousands of jobs. Today, with jobs involving computers, security is of utmost importance. And there's one more thing. Under a swastika, every single one of you in this room is a target. You are a target strictly because of the color of your skin, because of your religion, because of your national origin, 
because of the books that you read or even the friends that you have. In any oppression, I don't care what it is, there are always four groups of people. They're the victims, the bully, the just, and the bystanders. The victims, well, they can be divided into the dead who are commemorated by tombstones or beautiful memorials, or in Germany by little plaques in the sidewalks. And the survivors, well, the few of them, they ended up in displaced person camps. Some of them went back home, and when they went back home, they were murdered by the local populations. The bully and his gang, Hitler, Goering, and Goebbels committed suicide. Goering was sentenced to be hanged, but uh, never came to this. But what happened to all these thousands of SS men, those guys who worked in the concentration camps? 9,000 of them had escaped to South America. 9,000 of them. Amongst them, the angel of death, who lived in Brazil and in 1978 accidentally drowned on the Brazilian coast. And then there were the just people. People who, the good people who did something. There was Senpo Sugihara, a Japanese diplomat. He saved 6,000 people, he lost his job, he died in utter poverty. And when he was asked, why did you do it? He said, it was the right thing to do. There was Monsignor Hugh of Flatty, an Irish priest in Rome. He saved about 3,700 Roman Jews. He was known as the Scarlet Pimpernel of the Vatican. He saved about 400 escaped prisoners of war. And when he was asked, why did you do it? He said, it was the right thing to do. There were in the valley in Le Chambon, whole village, everybody participated in hiding people in basements, big styles, attics. They saved about 5,000. And when they were asked why, they said it was the right thing to do. And then there was Sir Nicholas Winton, actually, at that time he was just playing Nicholas Winton. He was a British stockbroker. He went to Czechoslovakia and he saw lots of children without parents. So he forged document. He created a phony organization called the British Committee for Children in Prague. And he saved 669 children. Amongst them, he saved this little girl who had been my wife for 61 years, and she died. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. She died last December. But here's a picture of her and Mickey Winton. He died a few years ago at the ripe old age of 105. <laughs> and when he was asked, why did you do it? He said it was the right thing to do. And then there were thousands of righteous amongst the nation. People whose names we will never ever know. 
but they all did the right thing. And finally, we have the bystanders. I don't like to call them bystanders. I prefer to call them the good people who do nothing. If you ever find yourself in trouble, and if you are the victim, there's nothing much you can do about it. But if you're not the victim, you can join the bully, you can be one of the just people, or one of the good people who does nothing. To be a just person and do the right thing is easy. You judge the situation, you understand the problem, you solve it, and you take action. Don't wait for others, because other people are waiting for you, you're waiting for them, and nothing happens. Be the first to act. And just people are just people. They're just like you. Twelve million people were murdered. Who's the murderer? Is it the person who pulls the trigger? Or the good people who don't stop him? What kind of a person would you be when you know someone is in need? You can be one of the good people who does nothing. You can be like a friend of Annabelle Cat or Audrey Pot or these kids. <coughs> All had good friends. Annabelle Cat was taking dope. Her friends knew it. They could have reported it. She could have been helped. She could have been healed. But they didn't. She overdosed. She's dead. Audrey Pot, somebody took a picture of her in the nude, posted it on the internet. Her friends could have stopped it, but they didn't. She was so embarrassed, she committed suicide. She's dead. And these kids, they were all bullied. And their friends knew it. They all committed suicide. They're all dead. Don't be one of the good people who does nothing. Help someone without being asked. And simply ask yourself, what is the right thing to do? Then do it. Don't abandon your friends. Speak up. To speak up may save a life. Speak to your teachers, security staff, parents or guardians. You're not little kids. You can open your mouth, you have brains. So do it. At the beginning of my presentation, I answered many questions. Now, by a show of hands, I'd like you to answer just one question. How many of you will promise to help a friend without being asked? Let's see. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you very, very much. Don't walk away when you see someone needs help. Don't let it happen. Because now you know what happens when we don't take care of each other. And please, keep your promise. You may be saving someone's life. And just remember the beautiful words of Dr. Martin Luther King. He said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.